a unique opportunity to transform the Indian economy by Salman Anis Soz. To briefly introduce the book, as the NDA government completes its term ahead of the general elections, it's time to evaluate its performance, specifically in terms of its management of the economy. The book is a critical assessment of five years of the brand of economics that Prime Minister Modi has championed, often referred to as Modi-nomics. Brought into power with the biggest political mandate in almost three decades, did the NDA government succeed in gainfully transforming India's economic trajectory, or did it squander a once-in-a-generation opportunity? The book suggests it's the latter, and analyzes why the government's stewardship of the economy has been a great disappointment. To introduce the author, Salman Soz is an international development expert and an economic and political commentator. He is a former World Bank Group staff member with experience across a range of economic development issues in many countries around the world. He serves as a consultant to World Bank teams and has in the past been a consultant at the Asian Development Bank. He is a member of the Indian National Congress and a party spokesperson. He holds a master's degree in business administration from Yale University, New Haven, and a master's degree in economics from Northeastern University, Boston. He received a BA Honours in Economics from St. Stephen's College, Delhi. This evening, to release the book and discuss it, we are delighted to have with us Yogendra Yadav, sorry, Yogender Alag, former Minister of Power, Planning and Science and Technology, Yamini Ayer, President and Chief Executive, Center for Policy Research, Raghav Behel, founder of the Quint and Bloomberg Quint, and senior financial journalist, Mithali Mukherjee. I invite all the panelists to please unveil and formally launch the book. a video message by Ashwan Sinha, who is unfortunately unable to be here due to ill health. For all my sincere apologies for not being personally present on this uh, very important occasion. Salman Soz had spoken to many to me uh, many weeks ago and we had agreed on this date. Unfortunately, as he had perhaps mentioned to you, I am unable to participate in person because of a hurt knee which does not permit me to walk uh, for the time being. Uh, coming to the subject of this evening, Salman's book, The Great Disappointment, I must compliment him on writing a very lucid book, not only on the current economic situation which prevails in the country, but also the long history through which this country has gone over the last 70 years after independence. Uh, it's a seminal book. It will go a long way in informing not only economists but others about uh, the history of Indian economy and its current state of affairs. Now coming to the subject of the current state of affairs, I'd like to make only three brief points. The first is a government will be judged by its performance against the promises that it made, uh, not against uh, government's uh, performance which have been, uh, which have ruled in the past and on which 
the people of India have already passed a judgment. The second is that uh, people will try and understand before coming to a conclusion the circumstances with which the government was confronted and if the circumstances were favorable then why didn't the government perform as well as it could and the third point is is the government being honest in presenting a picture of the economy today as it is doing uh, with all kinds of manipulated data now this government inherited an economy which was not in the pink of health no doubt but then soon enough everything has started falling in place world crude oil prices collapsed and gave a huge relief to the government and the claim of stability in the economy whether it is the fiscal deficit or the current account deficit or inflation is largely derived from this windfall of falling crude oil prices. We noticed that the moment crude oil prices rose even moderately, the government uh, was on all fours and could not manage the situation, leading to great uh, frustration amongst the people. Then the second is the government has not fulfilled the promises it made, either with regard to doubling of farmers' incomes or with regard to employment creation. In fact, on both the fronts, it, had failed, it has failed miserably. And uh, the third point, which is most worrisome to a person like me, is the, uh, you know, the penchant of this government to interfere with statistics. Whenever something which is not uh, uh, to its liking comes uh, forward, in terms of data collected by experts of the government, it either suppresses the release of that data or it is um, uh, negating that data or manipulating that data and putting up dressed up figures. Now this is the most worrisome thing because no government in the past has ever attempted a thing of this kind this directly impacts the credibility of the government in uh, not only within the country but also outside and uh, this is one of the things which is going to uh, cause enormous damage to the reputation of our statisticians and the entire uh, data collection uh, machinery. So this is something which uh, needs to be uh, discussed and uh, all of us need to raise our voice on this uh, issue today and tomorrow and until it stops. Uh, I would like to end by saying that uh, Salman has done an excellent job of writing this book. I hope it will serve the purpose that he has in mind. My congratulations to him and all the very best. Thank you. Gratitude, of course, to Mr. Yashwant Sinha. As you heard, unfortunately, he couldn't make it here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this book discussion. Congratulations again, Salman, on your book. And thank you, Swati, for that introduction. Not to worry, I think even if Yogendra Yadav was here, he would have to have had many similar things to say about the context of what we're going to be discussing. Uh, Salman, before we begin in what promises to be a very engaging discussion, this is more or less a profile about one prime minister but you also have a note from another Prime Minister <laughs> walking you through this book and his thoughts on it. And the other Prime, the other prime Minister could not be here today and in fact he, uh, he was supposed to and he then could not and he wrote and he said, you know, I guess I have to share this with you, that uh, he said it would have given me great pleasure to accept your invitation. However, I have an urgent uh, prior commitment for the evening uh, which prevents him from attending. Uh, of course, uh, the subject matter today is about the current prime minister, uh, and uh, he had he had said that I don't you know I don't want to be, sit, be sitting on the stage. I'd rather be in the audience because I want to listen to this uh, from a different perspective. Uh, but there were some sensitivities, of course. I mean, he's the former prime minister, 
so unfortunately he couldn't be here, but, uh, but uh, I'm sorry about that and he's sorry too. Uh, but I think if we have a good discussion, uh, if we come up with some ideas uh, for the future, uh, perhaps uh, that will serve his purpose as well. Thank you. Thank you, Salman. That is, of course, Dr. Manmohan Singh we're talking about. Uh, so, in a couple of days from now, 800 million people across the country will go out to cast their vote. Timing has been great on your book, Salman. Uh, I think the, the title of the book is fairly self-explanatory in terms of how you're dealing with the economic situation, and you've got some comments on Twitter on that as well. But walk us through why you know, the thought of this book came about and what brought you to this juncture. Well, you know, um, I've been I've been writing about um, the economy for a while now, and um, I remember on, I mean, I'm a member of the opposition. Let's face it. So, uh, well, in some ways, when May sixteenth, two thousand fourteen happened, I was in the Congress headquarters as a spokesperson of the party from seven a.m. till eleven p.m. Uh, took a barrage of uh, hits about the Congress party's, uh, uh, you know, uh, devastating defeat. And you know, I was thinking to myself at that time, going from one show to another, I said, my God, I mean, all the things that uh, uh, Narendra Modi has talked about, uh, if they do all this, you know, they're gonna be in power for a long, long time. And um, uh, you know, and now you may say, what's wrong with that? If they do all these things, what's wrong with that? Because my, my feeling was that, you know, you can have the economy grow, but at the same time, if you have the kind of uh, narrative that was being put, you know, put put out in terms of a very, to my mind, very divisive narrative at that time. I felt that would not be good for the country, and n no amount of economic growth uh, could actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, whitewash that. But at the same time, you know, I also felt that our country, obviously, we're still a poor country, uh, and there are millions and millions of poor people. Uh, malnourishment is extremely high. Uh, you know, all the problems that this country has. So I thought, you know, after 30 years, we have a government uh, that uh, has a majority on its own. Maybe, you know, maybe they do things for the country. Maybe in that sense, one should be hopeful. I think that's why the, the, the title of the book is The Great Disappointment. I've been criticized by many on, on my side for saying that this, well, why are you disappointed? Uh, I am disappointed because I'm also a citizen. And I, 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 I have some empathy for those who are less fortunate. And in that sense, you know, I had hoped that all the things that had been said uh, would, would kind of, you know, uh, come to fruition, uh, and they have not. And the other thing that really bothered me, and I can be very open about this, what bothered me was this slogan of, uh, in 60 months we'll do what others did not do in 60 years. And I think that is, that really stuck with me, and I think that is the reason I wrote, I start the book with this chapter called uh, the inheritance. Uh, what did every prime minister inherit? Uh, Nehru inherited uh, the largest refugee crisis outside World War II, along with a severe shortage of food. In fact, if you look at the first budget speech, it is only about food. There was no food. There was not enough food in the country. Uh, and you know, every prime minister got some inheritance, and every prime minister stands on the shoulders of somebody else. Uh, but what I felt was wrong was the way uh, uh, candidate Narendra Modi and now Prime Minister uh, seemed to negate what others had done uh, because he, was, he had to build on that. So I think that really bothered me. That's in some ways the genesis of this book. In one aspect, we do have a situation we haven't had in many decades, Salman, which is the NSSO data related to unemployment and the kind of figures we're looking at, particularly for youth unemployment. Raghav, you've been watching the economy and markets for a long time. How important or front and center do you think an issue like unemployment is when it comes to the crux of it? Well, first of all, Salman, congratulations. Uh, uh, and for this opportunity that you've given us to be with you on this wonderful day. Uh, I, I also believe Salman's a, a gentleman politician <laughs> for having used the word disappointment. <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, I, I would have been closer to betrayal. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Be that as it may. Uh, you know, this whole bit about uh, employment, uh, I mean, some of the numbers uh, uh, which uh, have been not released and which are therefore coming out in, in driblets are astonishing. I mean, if you're going to have in a, a, a drop in the absolute number of uh, people employed, absolute number, not percentage, 
then the, you know then I don't think you need any further evidence to talk about the kind of crisis uh, we are in. And I think it's uh, it's all ultimately a crisis of both. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, a bunch of statistics which are showing that the economy uh, is reasonably buoyant. But when you juxtapose those numbers with some of the real data that's coming out, uh, the story doesn't hold up. Uh, most of it is uh, uh, government expenditure. Uh, private investments are really down, which are the engine of growth. Uh, private consumption uh, is also down, which is the uh, engine of growth. Agriculture is woeful. I mean, if you have a situation where uh, uh, real wages in agriculture are deflationary, uh, then you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the ability of the economy to grow is, is uh, it, it's impossible for the economy to grow. So just one leg of government expenditure uh, and a bit of uh, window dressed uh, uh, data is not going to uh, hide the fact that you are looking at a true um, uh, employment crisis. Now whenever, you know, whenever a number like one million a month is, is bandied about, I, I take that also with a little bit of a um, you know, you need, you need to moderate that number. Uh, I don't think we need one million jobs because the labor force participation rate, just all of that. But you certainly do need about 600,000 jobs a month. Uh, and I don't think you need uh, a, a great, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, statistician or economist or administrator to tell you that we are very, very far from that. And I just want to add one more point, which I, uh, which I, I in, in, in current economic discourse is not being focused on as much, but to me, which is uh, quite a stunning statistic, and I was going through that, the uh, level, and I'm sure Salman will agree, and I'm sure he's dealt with that in the book as well, that the level of the real interest rate. I don't think we have seen a situation in this country where the real interest rate uh, is today, and if you define it as state, the State Bank of India prime lending rate minus the, the, the consumer price inflation, for the last four years, it's been in double digits. We've got a real interest rate of 10 to 11 percent in the economy. So when you put all of this together and you say India's growth is dismal, you know why. You know why. Uh, under the UPA 2, uh, for uh, while they were handling the, a crisis, the real interest rate was still about 4 or 5 percent. Uh, but it's 10, 11 percent today. So where will investment come from? Where will growth come from? Where will jobs get created? Um, it's, it's an equation which is self-explanatory. Uh, Yamini, you've made the point in you know in previous conversations about the employment issue, saying that this looks more like a supply side problem. Do you think that's what's happened over the last couple of years? The skew has gone completely askance. Well, I I think we are you know at, on the one hand there was a huge opportunity because India is sitting on a huge demographic advantage. The challenge comes from the fact that they haven't been able to convert that advantage into in fact creating a cohort of young people that have alignment of skills with the market uh, as the market is evolving. Um, and, you know, we, we, one part of the problem is a fairly fundamental one. You have more children than ever before finishing eight years of schooling and you still have nearly 50% of them barely in a position where they can read a standard two textbook. Uh, the other part of the challenge is the extent to which the education system is being able to skill in a manner that aligns to, to dynamic market needs. And the market needs are evolving and changing. Uh, you have the same conversation one year from now and you're going to be talk, looking at a very different kind of context because uh, the combination of technology and the changing nature of capital itself is going to place a whole different set of pressures on, on, on the kinds of skills that are needed. All of this requires a very agile uh, and capable uh, policy environment, one that actually gets appropriate feedback loops from, uh, from the ground up and then is able to appropriate those feedback loops and actually look at reinventing policy as it goes. For the moment, when we think about the challenge of jobs, we've uh, tried to unpack that very much in the frame of skilling in the frame of uh, you know, looking for, uh, you know, uh, t talking a lot about the challenge of manufacturing, in the frame of uh, the, the challenge of, ag of, of the agrarian crisis. But really, what you see, the, the nature of the economy in India today is extremely dynamic. Where is the transition happening mostly? It's happening in the transition between rural and urban. 
Today, I don't think we even have an understanding of what those new rural to urban transition economies look like. What is the kind of market demand and how then does one create uh, a trained and skilled youth force that is going to be absorbed in these new and transitional economies. This is a very big concern and it's a very big challenge, one that I don't think any government uh, has been able to fully grasp or understand, but that really is where the focus needs to be. Dr. Anak, of course, you have the benefit of having looked at the political universe as also headed several organizations and institutions. What's your sense of what's bubbling with the youth right now on the unemployment issue as also their sense of this economy? Uh, I think I'd uh, like to underplay my uh, ministerial positions. I, I don't know whether there was an accidental prime minister, but I can truthfully say that I was an accidental minister. <laughs> uh, but I think your main question as to where the jobs have to come, you see, um, I think these numbers, one has to be very careful when one talks about employment numbers in India. Because a large number of people, they do something and it's called employment. That's the way it's measured. Uh, that's the way the numbers come when they let you see the reports, which is becoming increasingly scarce now. Yeah. Uh, there is a story around that, but I don't have the time to get into that. The direct answer to your question is, as far as I'm concerned is, we must grow fast industrially. Uh, we must grow fast in agriculture. And unless those questions are addressed, some of my previous speakers have talked about them, I discovered something called um, census towns. These are towns to which the farmer, and in many cases the farmer is a lady, brings her produce. And the infrastructure there is terrible. So yes, she is employed, but what does employment mean? Uh, I was in Godra and I was coming to from Dahod to a city and there there's a, there's a famous NGO. This man died last week. He does irrigation cooperatives for tribals. And that night, Sharmishta, his wife, has introduced me to a large number of ladies who were doing fruits and vegetables and poultry. And in Godra, I don't, you won't believe it, there was a crowd collection. So I stopped my car, I said, Kya ho She had been hit by an SUV. Salman talks about some of these things in his book. We have the largest collection of markets in the world. That's what Perth Satellite shows. But what is a market? This lady was sitting in a market. So as far as rural people are concerned, unless you create that infrastructure, unless you support the organizations of farmers, if we had 200 farmer producer organizations instead of Amul because you know cooperatives get into Sarkari dominance, then Hardik Patel would not have been there because he would have got a job of 20,000 rupees per month. He's from my state, so I hope he didn't get angry with me. I will enjoy that young man in the form of ECG. I know I love young people who have so much of energy in them. Skills. But it's not just skills, it's, you know, behind skills are more serious issues. Salman talks about some of them. The years after independence. My favorite demographic, Dividend Yamini, is when this young lady goes to college and the first child comes late and the last child comes first. And that creates a demographic profile for us which is some of the best in the world, provided you do something about it. That's the question of infrastructure, involving local institutions, building skills around them, getting them to certify skill development programs, rather than, you know, just Sarkari Bureau of Labor Statistics, K employment program. Salman, uh, let me play devil's advocate here. 
So Chief Bhalla writes in the Express this morning saying that the data isn't that bad if you look at things like the annual survey of industries. So the problem is the fact that data isn't being released, which he agrees is a problem, but the data in itself is not that bad. <laughs> Everybody wants to hit this for Everyone six. Everyone wants to talk about Mr. Bala. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I think Surjit um, is an interesting uh, person. He, uh, I think, he used to write really well. But I think over time, what has happened is that, you know, I'm a politician. Yes, of course, there are biases, but at the same. And, and I think that is unfortunate because as an analyst, he can be quite provocative and you can have a discussion with him. But the fact of the matter is that uh, we have a very, very serious jobs problem. And this is, uh, you know, uh, you can be in denial about it, uh, which is okay, but then you're just doing a disservice to the country. Please don't call yourself a patriot or a nationalist if you're denying that we have a serious jobs problem. In fact, in, in the fifth chapter of the book, I actually talk about employment as an overarching kind of challenge for India. And you know, I can see a tsunami coming, right? I mean, on the one hand, uh, our, as uh, Yamini said, our education system is just not producing the kinds of uh, young people that we need uh, uh, in the future. And by the way, it's not just the school system. Think about malnutrition in this country, right? If you have about 40% of stunting, is it 40%, roughly, how will those kids learn? You can have the best schools, but if you have 40% stunting, those kids are not going to uh, learn. They're not going to learn well, and they're not obviously going to become productive citizens in the, citizens in the future. So, uh, so Jeet can say that uh, the data says this. Uh, yeah, they haven't released it, uh, but the data says this. But then, you know, let's face it: 45% high in unemployment uh, rate. That's a pretty bad number, no matter what way you look at it. I mean, today from the Indian Express, there's a report on uh, 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 men dropping out of the labor force. So what's going on in this country? Labor force participation is decreasing. That means fewer people are in the labor force. If you're in the labor force, if you either have a job or you're looking for a job. So we have a very weird situation in which unemployment rate is high. That is, people who are part of the labor force, they, they, their kind of unemployment, that's high. And also, there are fewer people in the labor force. That means people are dropping out. They, they, they just basically have given up. So they're losing hope. Yeah, they're losing hope. So job. that is yeah. not a good situation. That's a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. And then think about technology. Think about the future. Think about what kinds of jobs are going to be taken up because of advances in technology. We shouldn't worry, you know, we, we shouldn't worry about it. We shouldn't get immobilized by it. In fact, you know, if, if I may, there are, there are, you know, in the, in the fifth chapter, I talk about some principles, principles of, of econ for economic policy making. And uh, some, you know, I never thought I would have to write these, but I'll just kind of, I won't even go into the details, but I'll just say what they are, to my mind. One, do no harm. Demonetization. Do no harm. Surjit Bhalla likes demonetization. I don't know why. Raghav likes it even better. Get some comments from him. <laughs> embrace change. Change is coming. Don't be scared. It's coming, but embrace it. Invest in people. Unless we invest in people, India is not going anywhere. No matter what anybody says, no matter how much infrastructure spending you do, no matter how much uh, you know, uh, uh, industrialization you talk about, it's not going to happen. And finally, reinvent the role of the state. India's state needs to change, the institutions need to change. What The institutions that were relevant uh, many decades back, they're no longer relevant. We, they have to change too. Our government has to change. And frankly, in many respects, the government has to get out of the way because we are crushing businesses, small businesses. We talk about micro businesses, and we talk about uh, small and medium enterprises. They're really small. Compared to Chinese enterprises, they're really small. We need to give them incentives to grow. We shouldn't just tax the hell out of them, send too many inspectors and all this stuff. If we unleash that, these players, I think there is a chance. We need a bridge to the future that bridges through ec uh, expanded economic activity. We need real double digit growth, real, not the kind of stuff that is. In being. fact, let me get Raghav in on this because I, I Raghav, you've been in. Uh, uh, yes, please. Yes. Unless if, 
see Surjit Bhalla is a dear friend, so I wish he would be here to hear what I'm saying. Um, he's intelligent and he's very good, and his understanding of Indian statistics is excellent. So he can bore googlies of a kind which nobody will understand. He is absolutely right in what he has said. The annual survey of industry shows precisely that. But nobody has said that that is the issue. Why is the CSO's national income from the manufacturing sector not rising? Why is it that the growth is really coming from services? So he sidesteps that issue. So, uh, you know, it's the Mandal Committee which went into that. Because a large part of it is the informal sector. That's where the NSS gives you the data, which you play around with. And that's where the large scale employment opportunities are. So Jeet Bhalla is absolutely right. It has nothing to do with the main discussions that we are having. My only um, hope was that he'd be here, or I'd like meet him somewhere, because I don't want to say things about him behind his back. I will call him up as soon as I can. <laughs> what I said. You must fill us in on how that conversation goes. <laughs> the yeah, Mudra sure data, as well, of course, remains unreleased for the third time now. Raghav, uh, the point I was making was that you've been an entrepreneur through many political uh, leaderships. Would you say this government has been pro business? <laughs> you know, I the the biggest the greatest betrayal that I think uh, this government has had. I have not seen an expansion of the state uh, in the last twenty five years as I have seen in these five years. The state is all over. Uh, whether it's in the bond market, whether it's in the debt market, whether it's in expenditure, investment, RBI. So the state is all over. Discretionary approvals uh, have never been as difficult as they are uh, under this government. Uh, the nature of industrial consolidation is increasingly becoming bigger business, bigger business, bigger business. The point Salman makes about the fact that there are smaller, nimbler organizations uh, which are getting absolutely waylaid uh, by whether they have to do this GST filing or that GST filing. I mean, look at, uh, look at just the GST. Last week you say uh, we will we will have five percent on real estate with no input credit. So suddenly one fine morning you wake up and you change the rule. Now tell me what is if there is no input credit? Is it a GST? Is it even a GST? Does it even satisfy the definition of a GST? Fair enough. You made one wrong decision that happened last week. Last evening that decision is also rolled back and you said now you have an option. You can do twelve percent or five percent without input credit. I mean, you know, some of the decision making is so arbitrary. Uh, sorry, I mean, it's unintelligent, economically unintelligent, and that's tying up enterprise completely. So we have seen a massive expansion of the state, massive. Uh, but what we have seen is a real whittling down uh, of, of private enterprise. I, I'm sorry, this goes against every tenet that this government is putting out, or the propaganda that the prime minister does. I mean. Angel tax. Do we even know what that's done uh, to, to uh, smaller enterprises? I mean, you, you have a situation, and I don't know how many people here uh, you know, have gone beyond the headline. What is the angel tax? I receive capital from an investor. Nowhere in the world, nowhere in the whole world do you have a situation where capital gets taxed as income. It gets taxed as income. And you slap a 35% tax on me, and then you send me a notice and say, I'm attaching your bank account. This poor fellow is a two crore rupee enterprise who just got an investment and suddenly he's told that no, it's not two crores your value, your value is 50 lakhs. Therefore on one crore 50 lakhs, I'm slapping a 35% tax on you. Therefore you pay me 50 lakh rupees and if you don't pay me 50 lakh rupees, I'm attaching your bank account. And in the case of one entrepreneur, they went into his bank account and took the money out. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are happening in this country. So it is the most interventionist, the most statist, uh, and the most anti-private enterprise government that I have seen in the last 30 years since India liberalized. There is a, a couplet that puts it quite eloquently, Raghav. Na jane kyun ye lagne laga hai, wo kehne lagay hai ki 
पूछना मना है यान ही लेट मी यू नो शिफ्ट दिस कॉन्वर्सेशन फ्रॉम इट्स फ्रॉम इट्स अर्बन लेंस टू द रूरल लेंस व्हिच हैज एक्चुअली आल्सो बीन फ्रंट एंड सेंटर द फार्मर क्राइसिस हैज नॉट बीन एज मच ऑफ अ हेडलाइन एज वी हैव विटनेस्ड इन द लास्ट फ्यू मंथ्स व्हाट डू यू थिंक हैज हैपेंड इन दैट एंटायर एरिया ए एंड डू यू थिंक इनफ हैज बीन डन एट ऑल इन टर्म्स ऑफ इंप्रूविंग क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ I think there there are a whole set of fairly deep and fundamental challenges that the agrarian sector has been confronted with that pre, that in my view predate these last 5 years and government after government has consistently assumed that the transition from farm to non farm will address the challenge of low agricultural productivity so in a sense we are seeing now the consequences of a long period of complete and absolute disregard for fundamental structural transitions that needed to take place to enhance agricultural productivity across uh, over the last many decades agriculture has essentially been a fairly neglected sector um i my sense of where we the sort of bubbling up of the crisis has has of course to do with a set of uh, uh, particular reasons related to policy decisions that this government has taken particularly around uh, managing inflation which has had a direct impact on 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 farmers and i think that's an interesting political tension right where where um in some senses and uh, you know you're protecting one part of your water bank without really looking at the larger context and the implications that will have uh, on the on the broader economy and of course you top it up with demonetization and bang you've got where you have uh, uh, over these last 2 to 3 years um where what's particularly been disappointing is uh in the uh, articulation of the challenge even though i think after many many uh, decades we have seen farmers coming to the streets what to me has been particularly important about the farmers protests that we witnessed over the last year to year and a half is in some sense the diversity of who's coming to the streets it's not uh, just the landed farmers it is a complete coalition across and it actually tells you that rural india is going through a very deep structural transformation that we haven't at the policy level been able to fully grasp yeah. and that is bringing the landless and the landed in some senses in 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 into a new coalition that is protesting the state and if you look at the asks although a lot of the conversation has focused on c2 a2 fl um you look at the long list of us it starts with msp and it ends with forest rights act so it in fact gives you a really good uh, uh, clarity on the extent to which rural distress how deep rural distress is and how we don't actually have the right kind of policy tools to even understand what's happening and then think about what needs to be done to strengthen and deepen of course a lot of this also has to do with the fact that uh you are seeing the kind of opportunities uh of the, of of uh, hastening that transition from farm to non farm uh and that has a lot to do with a, an entire range of things including the nature of social policy and the fact that social policy hasn't in fact uh yielded the kind of benefits uh that 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 had been hoped uh and over the last 5 years in particular i think you've seen a fairly uh confused approach uh to what needs to be done uh, on the one hand there was a, a, a to start with an assumption that less government is go- at least when it comes to welfare is probably better and quite soon on uh that uh, argument changed to more welfare but it is a more layered schemes none of which really add up to a substantive whole and today we are now sort of fighting over msp versus pm kisan and what of these bandages are going to is uh, sure. going to get us through the next few months uh, but i think the real challenge is deep the real challenge is structural uh, and the next government is going to be confronted with it and no amount of bandage is going to help fix the corpse this needs to be fixed very seriously mm. no that's a great point uh, saman you've also outlined in your book that you've looked at periods which had clear policy breaks let me ask you whether you see the last 5 years as a clear policy break 
or just a disappointment in an existing framework? You see, yeah, that, that's the interesting question, right? I mean, uh, uh, here we are, you know, we, we, uh, everybody talks about 1991, the reforms of 1991, right? But uh, when I was doing uh, my research for this book, uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, India's had some uh, very clear kind of uh, phases of growth, so to speak. Actually, the first growth phase was uh, uh, during Pandit Nehru's time from 1950 to uh, roughly 1960. Uh, it was 65, of course, he passed away in 1964. And that was the kind of, uh, you know, uh, that was a high growth phase. And, you know, we may not appreciate it right now, uh, but uh, in the pre-independence era, from 1900 to roughly uh, 1947, India's growth rate was about 0.1% uh, per annum. It averaged about that. And, uh, uh, and during uh, these 15 years that I talk about, it was close to, I think, 3 to 4%, something like that. Uh, and per capita income was almost 19 times higher on average during these 15 years compared to the uh, uh, time of the, uh, you know, or try time of British rule from 1900 to 1947. The second growth phase is actually the 1980 to 1990 phase. If you look at uh, you know all sorts of researchers uh, uh, have talked about you know the 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 break the in growth you know after the what we call the Hindu growth period uh, during Mrs Gandhi's time after that 1980 to 90 actually was a pretty high growth period before the structural reforms of 1991. In fact, the growth growth rates in the immediate aftermath of uh, the 1995 1991 reforms they were not that you know, uh, the growth rate was not that high. And then we, obviously during the UPA era, uh, uh, despite, uh, <laughs> despite the suppression of data and all that, that was a high growth uh, 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 period, and uh, perhaps it's the highest we've ever seen. Um, and uh, no matter what kind of revisions are put out, I think India's credibility, uh, the credibility of our national statistics has taken a huge hit. And trust me, I've come from the World Bank, uh, people are not going to just trust things from India anytime soon. And I think in that sense, we become more like China. Now, this government had an opportunity, had an opportunity to do something very different. And that is the disappointing part, right? I think they got, I don't know what it is. I think uh, uh, the first thing, if you remember, they went for land, the Land Act. They wanted to roll back the 2013 Land Act. They spent a lot of political capital on that. And that law had actually been notified on... Uh, the 1st of uh, uh, January 2014. So the law was not even under implementation and they went after that. In my view, you know, everybody talks about demonetization, everybody talks about uh, GST. I actually talk about the banking sector. I think the biggest problem was that they did not address uh, the NPAs in their first year. And by the way, this is not as if nobody knew about uh, the non-performing assets of the banking sector. This had been flagged by so many people. IMF had been talking about it, uh, the World Bank had been talking about it, the go government's own economic survey had been talking about it. Uh, you gotta, you've got to understand, the banking sector is your lifeblood. Yeah. If the banking sector uh, is clogged with NPAs, you, you're going to get a heart attack. And that's what our eco economy got. The economy basically got an attack. And nobody seemed to be focused on that. The government started focusing on efficiency. The prime minister started looking at projects, you know, trying to do all these infrastructure projects and all this stuff. And they went out of land. And of course, the land uh, uh, thing was a fiasco. Uh, the Sud Bhutki Sarkar jab came and then they dropped it. So that was the big thing, not trying to clean up the banking sector at that time aggressively. You know, let's face it, Prime Minister Modi was extremely popular then. He remains popular, you know. It's not that he doesn't, uh, is not popular, but you know, those days was the peak of his popularity. If he had said that I have, a, I have inherited a problem, this is the banking sector, I mean, everybody's been talking about it, I need to fix this. Now they tell, you know, I think that would have been a great use of political capital. I think he really missed, messed it up. I don't know who gave him this advice. I don't know whether they were even thinking about it, but if anybody, to my mind, if anyone says that demonetization and GST, GST are the biggest problems, no, I think it was, uh, you know, a complacency about the banking set. Raghav, uh, every tra tragedy has a climax. Would you say INFS was the climax for the banking industry, or as Salman points out, was it a series of mini heart attacks that got us here? I, I couldn't agree more with Salman that, that that was a problem screaming to be done. And then on top of that, you had the biggest good luck that any administrator in India could ever have. 
oil crashed from 130 to 30. Uh, and that gave you, you know, that gave you close to 7 or 8 lakh crore uh, in revenue that was just a windfall. And you know what was needed to fix the banking sector? 5 lakh crore. So God gave it to you. Uh, you didn't even have to look for it in your fiscal budget. You got it extra, thrown from the heavens. Uh, but you know, I don't. I, I fully agree with someone. I don't know what took control of this government. They said probably this. You know, Abhi Delhi dur hai. This problem will get sorted out by itself. But the bomb kept on becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and really, that is what is at the core of 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 the of the slowdown that you have, uh, along with the fact that the government is overspending its way out. Uh, you know, uh, you have a situation uh, that the Reserve Bank of India cuts 25 basis points and the 10-year treasury doesn't move and the next day goes up by about 8 or 10 basis points. You haven't seen this kind of behavior in the economy. So there's something very, very wrong and fundamentally what's wrong is that the government's arithmetic is out of control. Uh, and the government's arithmetic is now, and one of the things is, 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 bank, uh, uh, is bank books which have not been fixed. Now what you've done is, you said, I'll put 3 lakh crores. I think they, have, they put about 3 lakh crores in, in bank recap. But you know, one of, the, one of the fundamental lessons you learn in business school on day one is that if you have a problem, go and fix it in one go. Don't try these driplets of 30,000 crores year one, 40,000 crores year two, 50,000 crores year three. Because then that's like droplets of water being just, uh, they just burn away. So if you have a 3 lakh crore problem, have a plan to fix the 3 lakh crore problem day one. And honestly, if they had done that, and they had, oh, yeah. they had the oil prices, uh, so they blew that, uh, they blew that whole thing uh, away. And now uh, they are talking about putting one lakh crore this year, but the problem is now ten lakh, eleven lakh crores, uh, and you've already, I mean, you've already written off almost four lakh crores of NPAs. So despite having written off four lakh crores, you still have a ten point three percent NPA problem, and you've put in three lakh crores of bank recapitalization funds behind it. So really, it's it's a it's a saga of mismanagement. I, I mean, I've got nothing else, uh, you know, no other way to describe it. Uh, Dr. Alok, we've circled the issue but not discussed it enough. Uh, as you said, there was this point where the persona was larger than the person, and that's when, along with Trump becoming the president of the United States, India woke up to demonetization. Who do you think uh, advised on that particular topic? Well. <clears throat> I can only tell you that Urjit Patel is a good friend of mine. <laughs> He's from my home state. I'm the chairman of the Gujarat Economic Society. And one year we call as economists from outside Gujarat and another year from within Gujarat. So one year we called him. My understanding is, I, I don't want to quote anybody, but with some information, that the Reserve Bank was not involved in designing the demonetization decision. Um, I say that and I duck because if you ask me to prove it, <laughs> which I should because I'm a professional economist, I find it difficult, but you should let people like me speculate sometimes. Right? <laughs> Sir, there's word that even the finance ministry didn't know about it. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and, he, he went not. and you know, once it was done, he took it seriously. It had terrible consequences, <laughs> particularly for the agricultural sector. Because uh, somewhere when the Kharif is coming in, Vajar Saab, you've been a civil servant for a long time, you choke the credit channel. Because remember, the co-ops were not going to be able to cash the new. You remember that? Now, you know, whenever I get tired, I get a headache, I take my wagon R and I go into a village, Madam uses the baker car that we have with the driver. And you go to a chopal and you know this really hurt them. And then in the next Rabi they didn't even have funds for seeds and fertilizers and so on because you destroyed the credit channel. So and then you said, Baba, oh, this was done earlier. Well when it was done earlier I was in the government. And there is no comparison because uh, a hundred rupee note then, by now, I mean, was worth two rupees given the price inflation. And what IG had done was something totally different. So all that was uh, for the birds. And it took quite some time for Indian agriculture to get back. 
And that's why you see a very poor performance. And agricultural capital formation has yet to take off. Now, it is true that we have a high rate of growth. Not agriculture, eh? incidentally. Agriculture and manufacturing growth, according to all statistics, even the ones which Professor Mandel didn't have access to, show that it didn't grow. And so, um, capital formation is rising. At the same time, the growth rate is not rising. Now, somebody has to worry about that. And there's been no less of government in these few years. We've had, I mean, you know, they, this, they stop centrally sponsored schemes, and you can always blame that and say, let me get the nation But you now have more centrally sponsored schemes, you only don't call them that. Because you call them this yojana and that yojana. And the funds are not allocated according to any rule based system, Vajatsa which we were bound by, I mean, Deputy Chairman had very little flexibility. The funds depend on what the powers that be decide. So some states get more, others get less, and the ones who get less, they keep on complaining, and the press puts it in page 11. So, uh, <laughs> no, I think your question, demonetization, did affect the economy somewhat seriously. We do need some kind of planning both for strategic policies of this kind, as well as for some of the bigger issues that we've been discussing on land and water and so on. I keep on writing about that because I hope someday there'll be a government which will take that up. It's all very well <coughs> to abolish the Planning Commission. We all wanted it to be changed. But to create a body which has no resource allocation powers. You know, the Chinese changed the Planning Commission, but they gave the new Social Development Committee, which was the new Planning Commission, allocation powers. I chair a committee in one of the ministries, and it will remain unnamed because I don't want to be unfair to that secretary. And I said, he said, yes, Samasya has said, kya kare? So I said, well, why don't you go to Niti Ayog? He said, sir, aap hote the, to lecture to milta tha, par paise bhi thode milte the. Now we only get lectures, and for that I would rather come to your institution. So you must get back to the not just collection books, however attractive. And some of them are pretty good schemes. Whether you like it or not, Swachha Bharat is a very good scheme. But you know, not seeing the linkages, putting it, everything in what are called bins and so on, I think creates problems. So I hope the new government, and I'm not making a political statement, it could be of any party, including the people who are opposed to Salman. <laughs> that they will address the issue. I think they will happen. Yamin, let me get your thoughts in on this demonetization and the impact on the farming community. And I just want to layer that because I think what didn't get said with that CMI data is not just for the male labor force, but the fact that the female labor force has seen the sharpest fall, as also that demonetization actually hit women much harder. I'll answer your question, but first I have to take on the such point. I could see Yamini's I was taking him on. I just want to build on something that you said because I actually I think it, that some of these things are quite important. We saw, we've seen over the last five years a very uh, critical set of structural shifts in how government of India is supposed to function. And two of those critical uh, shifts, one uh, is uh, the replacement of Niti Ayo, uh, of planning commission with Niti Aayog. And the second has to do with this dynamic of federalism, particularly the dynamic of center and states, which are sort of in, 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 in embedded in there. Uh, when Prime Minister Modi was Chief Minister Modi, he was without doubt one of the most critical advocates for greater states' rights. Uh, an argument that Professor Alag and I have to have later is on centrally sponsored schemes. I dislike them immensely. I'm with Prime Minister Modi on that one. However, exactly, that's the point. That you, uh, you know, the, the whole narrative of cooperative, competitive federalism, of Team India, 
of actually creating an argument that the planning commission needed to go because the planning commission was a big bad bully that would bring states in and sort of order them to do things. It is true and it's empirically proven that there was a fair amount of political discretion in the allocation of funds that the planning commission made to states. The World Bank has many studies uh, that highlight this fact. But what, in the absence of long-term strategic thinking, what you ended up doing was dismantling an institution that had a certain logic. And, and that is exactly the point that you made, that you can't have, in, in the nature of how bureaucracy functions and in the nature of how governance takes place, you remove the fund allocation role of an institution and suddenly it's sort of, uh, you, you're left with a vacuum. Uh, in, in addition to that, what the government did do was to uh, take on board fully the recommendations of the 14 Finance Commission, which was a big attempt to shift the dynamic of centers and states. But essentially the temptation, because even as Chief Minister Modi used to talk about more rights to states, Administrator Modi has always been a very centralizing administrator. And you're seeing exactly that now in how Government of India functions. And that temptation then was too much. And by the way, bureaucrats, no offense, <laughs> love centrally sponsored schemes because you take it away and suddenly government of India doesn't have a role to play at all. So you, you and, and in, in this entire process, in fact, we have created a deep fundamental planning vacuum. There is no mechanism by which states have a sense of how much money they are going to get and therefore to be able to plan. Their own planning capabilities have atrophied consistently over decades of, uh, of, of over centralization. And you're basically now circling right back to a terms of reference for the 15 Finance Commission, which says, in fact, we have to now become even more centralizing. I have not seen a terms of reference that suggests to uh, the Finance Commission that it may want to consider performance metrics for implementation of flagship schemes, that it may want to consider costs of New India 2022, which are all sort of flagship government programs. So we, you know, I think we have ended up today in a place where we are seeing a very complicated uh, sh dynamic that is shaping between centers and states as uh, the story of inequality, uh, regional inequality across India is going to get sharper. That's going to be the big challenge uh, of the next two decades. This issue is going to become even more central. And the unity of India, the diversity of India, the idea of India is very much embedded in this, uh, in its federal structure. Um, and, and I think we are right now seeing a policy vacuum and more importantly, an institutional vacuum that can negotiate those relationships. And that's something to be quite worried about. And now I've taken all my time and I haven't got to your <laughs> question. <laughs> That's okay. I do want to get some questions in from the audience. But Salman, I want to ask you this. In your book, you um, there's a line where you write, his tenure has been transformational in one respect. The country is more divided than ever. Uh, what bothers you more about where we stand right now? The economic mess that you have detailed, because certainly that is the bulwark of any country, or the lines of hate that have been drawn across the length and the breadth of the nation? Well, look, I mean, I think, uh, I think no country that lacks social cohesion can give up, uh, uh, you know, in economic terms. I, I firmly believe that you need a, a certain degree of social stability in order for you to progress. And I think um, what has happened in the country in the last uh, five years, uh, in terms of this divisiveness and this hate, and this, I think that's really going to set India back. I think there are going to be uh, serious economic consequences uh, for that. So I, I, I don't really, I, I don't subscribe to the view that uh, you grow and you're going to have a great income and then suddenly uh, everything is going to be good and uh, these uh, forces will be arrested. I don't work, it doesn't work like that. I, I, I think the world uh, has enough uh, examples where, uh, you know, divide, uh, divisions in society ultimately boils uh, over into conflict, which holds economies back. But just on this demonetization bit, because that's also in some ways, you know, uh, uh, it's about policy, right? I mean, what do you do? I mean, how do you do it? How do you make policy? And I think j just because Yamini didn't get enough time, so maybe she yielded a bit of time to me. I just want to read a little bit uh, uh, from the book because I haven't, you know, uh, I think this whole idea that demonetization would have short-term consequences. Uh, or limited impact 
uh, adverse but limited. I think that is something that has not uh, panned out and that is not going to pan out. And I'll tell you, I, I just want to read a bit, um, uh, just take two minutes of your time because I think this is important stuff and this is something policymakers must keep in mind for the future. So uh, I just write that while I was convinced demonetization would have an adverse impact on the economy, initially I thought it would be of a short term nature. That's what I thought. I recall a Twitter exchange with economist Vivek Deheja, uh, who's uh, from Canada, who was supportive of the move at that time. In fact, they wrote Jagdish Bhagwati and Vivek and another gentleman uh, from Washington wrote a piece in Mint on how uh, demonetization was going. But not everyone was convinced that the adverse impact would be of the short-term variety. Economist Radhika Pandey at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, which is here in Delhi, and Rajeshwari Sen Gupta at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research wrote in December 2016, and I quote, the impact of the contractionary demand shock triggered by the November 8 currency ban will gradually radiate from cash intensive activities to virtually every sector of the economy. This will lower the GDP growth. The resurgence in growth may prove to be a challenge and may take longer than expected in an already sluggish investment scenario. End quote. And then I say, in the same piece they made a point that I found evidence for in, in the IMF paper that I mentioned about. In that IMF paper, what does it say? They say, basically the idea is the longer the time to uh, taken to normalize the situation, the deeper will be the damage inflicted upon the real economy. And some of the damage, and some of the damage caused may end up being irreversible. Demonetization's impact, some of the impact is likely irreversible. The reason is, you have demonetization, you're a business, and you shut down. Now certainly after seven, eight months, you're not going to restart that business. And I think there must be, I think, millions of small, small little activities that must have been finished because of demonetization. That is why I said, do no harm. One of the principles of economic policy making is do no harm. And I think Prime Minister Modi did something, I think, that was, uh, to my mind, an unthinking policy initiative. And that has caused harm to me. Can I just say one small thing? I think one, one of the reasons why you get uh, ill-thought policy like demonetization has to do with the consequences of a very centralized administrative character. And we, to be entirely honest, every single public commentator, and you quote many in your book, uh, who people who watched Gujarat, they knew this. Prime Minister Modi's administrative style has not changed from Chief Minister Modi. Okay, we papered over that. We papered over that and we forget that the core democratic impulse requires you to have a much, much more delegated and decentralized administrative function. You have to be far more consultative. And I think as public opinion makers, debaters, shapers, there is, you know, we all have to have, some, there has to be a degree to be to answer for, for missing these things. And so in that sense, I don't think that these last five years have been a great disappointment. I think they kind of fulfilled what I imagined these last five years to be. You obviously had a lot more hope. So we have a realist, a pessimist. <laughs> We've got it all. But let me get Dr. Alag and Raga's uh, thoughts in as well on this demonetization topic in specific. Dr. Alag, would you like to go first? On the demonetization issue. No, demonetization I've spoken, but in some of these larger issues which were discussed in the last two or three uh, uh, observations, I wanted to say something on that. Um, I know Prime Minister Modi very well. He was the chairman of my governing body for 10 years because he was in Gujarat and my research is, my permanent job is there. So there's a lot in uh, what you have said. I think he manages a small state very well. But um, I wanted to get at this issue which was talked about by Salman and others, the whole question of long-term growth of the economy. And uh, I think uh, Delhi being Delhi, one is being very polite. Some <laughs> conversations are not allowed. Um, but I would like to be polite with some things. Um, a great national leader whom I don't like because he's a great centralizer called me for a discussion 
and uh, I went there, there were a thousand people there, so I just said, and I'm going back. They said, no, 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 no. So he asked me, you have written a lot of things. You tell us that the future belongs to Hindustan or China? Okay, that was the question. Now, in a way, Salman's book, you know, if he hadn't given it the political slant, it would have been a good textbook. <laughs> Sorry, as an accidental uh, minister, I think that's important. You don't think good textbooks are important? I think good textbooks make the future. So I told him, look, because he speaks in Hindi, he's from the heart of central India, you can even guess who he was. So we say that we don't need to increase, we don't need to give good days. So the child of China is 38 years old. And our now is 32 years old, and it's less than that. So we need to increase investment rate. We need to increase investment rate. We need to increase trade. Because trade is a technology. The costs are reduced. And what is the trade? So I told him, look, if women are not in the case, so Aadha will go there. And if there will not be a Muslim, and there will not be a Christian, you know what he said? You are much too civilized. I don't know why you sent you to Harvard. To Yale. To Yale. Well, I taught at Penn, so it's a wrong school you went to. I taught him, get my PhD from there. Listen, if large minorities are going to be out of the rate of growth, you will never achieve an 8% growth rate, whatever you say. And if you don't have the guts to say it, well, I don't care. I, I don't live in this area. I'm here for some intense personal reasons. I don't go away. Somebody needs to say that. This whole, you know, you're talking about the future of India, a dream. We can be the only civilization which can show how Islam can be a part of a modern culture. The next century belongs to us if we do that. And if we keep on filtering about all these things with lovely models and so on. I love models. Uh, you know, my last book does good, some good modeling. But that's not the big issue. Rather, let me take your question because I remember that you were a very vocal and immediate of this demonetization debacle? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's immodest to say I told you so. <laughs> but, but on the 13th of November, 2016, precisely four days after, uh, uh, precisely four days after this, this move was done, I wrote, and it's on Bloomberg Quint, that the every penny is going to come back. And, and the reason for that is not, I, I, I'm not some great thinker or economist. I think I just knew that human nature is such that if you think you're going to immobilize a person's life savings and he's not going to clutch at a straw, by clutch at a straw, I, I will quote what Dr. Manmohan Singh said. This was monumental corruption. See, what anyone would do anything to convert his cash back into, a bank, into the banking system. And that's exactly what happened. Every penny came back. So what was the objective of demonetization? If the objective of demonetization was to create a digital trail of cash, which is what ultimately seemed to be the only fig leaf the government had to, to satisfy, uh, uh, to justify uh, demonetization. That, listen what we've done. Yes, all cash has come back. That's fine. Uh, but we have now have a digital trail of 360,000 accounts in which uh, uh, unaccounted cash. There are several other ways of creating the, that digital trail. You don't have to kill, uh, make people uh, disrupt all supply systems. So God knows whoever thought of it uh, had absolutely zero understanding of uh, of, uh, of how human beings behave in a crisis. They will do anything to survive. So really it was a monumental corruption scheme because bank managers made money, uh, people who made money were the ones who had, you know, uh, in, in the world of business who had entries of cash, uh, who could convert that cash, uh, people who could sell uh, their uh, second-hand cars for cash. Anybody who could exchange cash made 30 to 40 percent. Uh, and you know, on a 17 lakh crore uh, cash base, 30 to 40 percent is uh, exactly what Dr. Manmohan Singh said: monumental corruption. It it really was. So uh, honestly, it was uh, 
botched up in thought, botched up in implementation, and done by a group of people, as, as Yami said very clearly, that it was just, it's obviously, there's no, cons there's no someone, no one talked about, listen, what will happen if I tomorrow tell a uh, hundred crore people that all the cash that you have is gone. Someone should have modeled that. How will human behavior be? No one's gonna just, uh, you know, queue up like a lamb and say, nice, sab ye le lije. I'm saying. So no modeling, no thought, no consultative procedure, no understanding of how human beings behave in a crisis. And you had what you had. Which was followed by the multi-layered GST, Raghav. So <laughs> it, the echo chamber remained the same. But let me open up the house for questions. Do raise your hand. I'll, I don't know if there's a mic, but yeah, we'll try and get that to you. Do let us know who your question is addressed to, sir. 